Hello and welcome to Independence Institute Television. I am your host, Justin Longo, and with me in the studio today is Energy Policy Center Director Amy Oliver Cook. And today we're going to talk about the left, environmentalism, the hard left, the even further left, all sorts of different left people, and how that all relates to the uh, recent deal with um, Governor Hickenlooper, Jared Polis, various business groups, uh, apparently. So Amy's the expert on po uh, energy policy. So we have recently a deal that went down to prevent ballot initiatives from going on to this November's ballot that could have really harmed Colorado's economy. So tell us about this deal and tell us how that deal illustrates this crazy um, contention that's going on with the left right now. And I'm going to give you credit, first of all. We're going to title this Fracturing the Left. That is a beautiful term. Hydraulically fracturing <laughs> Hydraulic the left. Hydraulically <laughs> fracturing the left. Sideways <laughs> underneath the ground. All right. Let's start with there were four measures that were supposedly going to be on the ballot. And when I say supposedly, we know that two had turned in enough signature or had turned in enough signatures to get on the ballot. Whether or not they had been verified, that had not been done by the Secretary of State's office. So there were two what we call pro-industry ballot measures. And that's a little bit misleading. One was a fairness in severance taxes. So in other words, oil and gas provide a substantial amount of severance taxes to the state of Colorado. And Jerry Sonnenberg, who was the champion of this in the legislature, he had submitted bills, drafted bills, carried the legislature, or the pieces of legislation several times in the state legislature to have fairness in severance taxes. And what that means is those communities, and, and we get, you know, he gets it. If there are communities that don't like oil and gas, so therefore they're going to ban hydraulic fracturing. They shouldn't be forced to accept dirty money. Mm -hmm. I mean, Right. Uh, we know that they don't like it. They don't like the practice of hydraulic fracturing, which is funny because they equate hydraulic fracturing with all oil and gas drilling, which isn't the case. I mean, hydraulic fracturing is only a three to five day process in the 30 year life span of a well. It's this little tiny process that actually, when I say little tiny, it, it is, I mean it in the environmental sense, it actually reduces the footprint that oil and gas or that energy development leaves on the surface. And right, because so normal convention drill, conventional drilling is uh, straight down, straight down, bunch of times. Yep. You've got a whole a huge footprint. Hydraulic fracturing, fracking is one uh, hole, and then you go underneath the ground right. sideways. And, and that combined with horizontal drilling, so you could drill in any direction a mile and a half, and then so it's one wellhead. And, and, and in some cases, it's reduced the footprint 70%. So it's... It, it, may, it reduces the impact, reduces the surface impact. Anyway, so this first ballot measure was fairness and severance taxes. So communities that ban hydraulic fracturing shouldn't be forced to have to take dirty money. Well, and, and, it's, not, and it's fair to everybody else. If you're right. going to ban oil and gas, then you shouldn't get right. rewarded. Then, right. And so the communities that allow it would then be able to benefit from the development of the resources that is right underneath there with the, or within their city limits. So that was the first one. And, and I should point out, it was a statute. It was a statutory ballot measure. It was not a constitutional amendment. So it's something that could be tweaked by the legislature. Okay. The other one was really just a good government ballot measure. And what I mean by that is it was just, you have to have a fiscal note and on any ballot measure, much like you have a fiscal note on a piece of legislation. So those were both just statutory statutory pieces or statutory ballot measures the environmental left financed by jared polis mm -hmm. the among uh, others yeah yeah he was the financier chief financier of these ballot measures that the environmental left was pushing one was I would say death by regulation to the oil and gas industry it was a 2000 foot setback and so if you do that 2,000 feet in any direction, you're looking at like a 4,000 foot setback. I mean, it's an enormous, there, there would be no more oil and gas production in the state of Colorado beyond that. I mean, or at least it would be, it would probably eliminate 90% of it. So it's essentially death by regulation. That's what that, that's, that's why we called it a fracking ban. The other one was giving 
it was an environmental bill of rights. So I, I called it noxious weeds. <laughs> was the noxious weeds bill of rights in other words it put it put environmental values and scenic views into the state constitution because they deserve rights too so the deal was that jared polis would stop financing his ballot measures and we don't even know if he had the signatures nobody's seen him says he did we don't know he would pull his two Oil and gas would pull the two that they were financing, and right. we'd get them off the t- – and it wouldn't be a decision in November, and there'd be a commission, one of those commissions, yeah. to figure out what to do with oil and gas for more regulation. Well, as it turns out, the environmental left, the eco-left, the anti-energy left is really what it is. These are anti-energy folks that they, – they were furious because they apparently didn't get a seat at the table and right. didn't – have any say in this. So there's a, a significant divide within the left, progressive left umbrella. So the real hardcore Enviro left did not like the ceasefire that was agreed to. With no. the, you know, everyone just put their weapons away, we're going to let it be, and then we're going to have a blue ribbon panel commission or whatever that's going to come up with some nonsense baloney. They don't come up with anything ever. So What's interesting is I went and looked on some of their sites just to see what they were saying, and it was things like our government has turned against us. We're ruled by the mafia. It, it's oh. stuff. I mean, they are furious. We'll be back. We don't. Shane Davis, a.k.a. the Fractivist, mm-hmm. said we not only have an environmental crisis, we have a democracy crisis. I mean, these people are furious. So the idea that we have... Taking it off the table for November is, yes, that's true. But the idea that it's settled is not. We've simply kicked the can down the road. When we dodged a bullet in November as far as, as, far as having to vote on it. But it, it's coming back. And the other thing is the, the left was very concerned that this would these ballot measures the 2000 foot sec- setback and giving noxious weeds uh giving them their own bill of rights or their only <laughs> their own constitutional <laughs> amendment <laughs> yes you that thistle has a right to <laughs> exist i mean it makes me wonder was i gonna be able to spray them in my yard or so <laughs> if, they th- if they think that about the plants are, are they not what do they eat then i mean because even if they're vegan they're if they're vegan they're eating plants well so what do we yeah I, so if a plant has like a right to hu- to life or it has a you know bill of rights then how do they even eat plants the envi- it was the environmental rights and trees and plants and waterways and you have a right to clean air and we have a right to trees and it, it was really kind of funny so the the fear was at least this is sort of the whisper that that goes on in in political circles is that the left was concerned that these ballot measures being driven by the anti-energy left and financed by Jared Polis would actually benefit Cory Gardner, who is challenging Mark Udall for the U.S. Senate, and also help Bob Beaupre, who's challenging John Hickenlooper for governor, and that it could drive people to the polls, in which case then their fear is that those two would would win election. And you, I mean, they literally, you're talking about the balance of the U.S. Senate being balanced on top of those two constitutional amendments in the state of Colorado. That's how important they were. That's how much the left feared them. Is Governor Hickelumber getting credit for orchestrating the ceasefire? You know, that's a good... Or is he trying to take the credit? That's a good... That's a great question. The Denver Post has given him a bunch of kudos about, oh, the leadership and the ceasefire. And, but what is interesting is that, again, you go to some lefty, you know, left of center blog sites, certainly one gives... There's one well-known one here in Colorado that gives the governor credit. What's interesting is that if you read down through the comments section, you're seeing people say, no, we were sold out by environmental groups, not the far-left environmental groups, the 
or not the extreme far radical edge of the earth left, but that I, they call the mainstream. I wouldn't call Colorado Conservation or Conservation Colorado, whatever that group is, I wouldn't call them mainstream. They are significantly left of center, but I think they also realized they feared Udall and Hickenlooper losing, and that for them it was it was going to be worse if Hickenlooper and Udall lose. So they were willing to participate, actually orchestrate this ceasefire. So there are some who are saying that it was people that we lump into the environmental left that actually sold out other groups so that Hickenlooper and Udall wouldn't lose. It's kind yeah, of an interesting. I mean, those are, and you only find those things as you start digging through comments and some of these, these websites and blogs and things like that you start you start realizing the fracture that's right right the fracture and and actually it was really interesting too i remember tweeting something and the anti-energy left the anti-fracturing left the we hate all fossil fuels left i remember the tweeting back at me something about jared polis never spoke for us wow but you took his money well, wow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he may not have spoken for you, but his money did. <laughs> so we're we're seeing uh, not only is Jared, Jared Polis catching fire from various portions of the left, but Teflon John, the our governor here in Colorado, has also caught fire. So this is this is kind of fracturing the left into a bunch of different little pieces. Do you see this persisting? Yes. Over a year or two years, or is this something short-lived? Are they all? I mean, because they're really good at coming together in the end. They are very good. They are very good at that. And by the way, we saw this early on, earlier too. I mean, if you if you looked, if 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 you went looking for it, you could see where some of these anti-energy left folks were calling for the primary of John Hickenlooper to primary him because he wasn't he wasn't far enough to the left for them when it comes to energy. These are people who aren't going to stop until they've put an end to all fossil fuels. All of them. We're not talking about having 30% renewable mandate. That isn't good enough. Right. They that want us to look not, like Holland. Right. Yeah. It's not good enough that we get 30% or that, that government mandate 30% of our, the electricity produced to come from preferred sources such as wind and solar. That's not enough for them. It's 100%. That's where they're going. And until they get there, they're not interested in stopping. There isn't a compromise that's good enough for them. Right. So do I see it continuing? Yes. They start, They were patient at first. They did the 10%. Then 10 went to 20. Mm-hmm. 20 went to 30. They got the, renewal, or they got the uh, rural co-ops at a 20% mandate, that, but they want 100%. If you read what they're saying, it's they don't want fossil fuels at all, anywhere of any kind. This reminds me of you the, uh, the anti-smoking crusade that started, well, we just don't want any smoking on airplanes. That's reasonable. You know, it, it, the smoke goes into the entire cabin. And now look where we are in 2014. You can't smoke a cigarette outside at in Boulder on the Pearl Street Mall. Like that, this is, we went from right. can't smoke inside of an airplane, kind of reasonable, to now you can't smoke outside. <laughs> now you can't, <laughs> now the outside is illegal. Yeah, so. No, no, that's exactly, that's, it, it, it it's it inc- is. It's incre- incrementalism with it them, is right? incrementalism, and it's also, as each generation comes along, they have to sort of one up the generation before yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, well, my parents were, they were able to get smoking off of airplanes. I got smoking ban yeah. outside. Yeah, take yeah, that, take softies. That. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So, and if you, I mean, th- these people are very clear about it too. They want no fossil fuels. There isn't reason, there is not a reasonable compromise for them. And the left is where they are because the left is the one that embraced them originally. They were, mm-hmm. yes, come with us. It was, this was the Green Party. They brought them into the fold. And now what has happened is they're sort of eating their own. 
For uh, fans of the Independence Institute and energy policy, where should they go to learn more? Go to energy.i2i.org. Check out a little softer messaging we have fun with on Kids Are First. That's uh, kidsarefirst.org or .com. Either one will get you there. Find us on Facebook, too, Kids Are First. All right. Well, thank you for checking in on Independence Institute Television. Please check back to our YouTube channel for the latest from the Independence Institute. We'll catch you next time.